Region Europe is the international program of the University of Turin, pursuing a comprehensive knowledge of the European model of regional integration and of the EU as a global actor. The involvement of 45 guest lecturers coming from all across the world's most prestigious universities and institutions allows us to bring fresh and critical perspectives on crucial issues concerning European integration and the role of the EU in world affairs with a forward-looking approach. We want to introduce you to how the EU actually works from its beating heart, visiting its institutions and interacting with its actors. From its first edition, each year Region Europe has given the opportunity to more than 150 students coming from all over the world to gather and exchange views and experiences. Thank you, Giovanni, and thank you for the invitation. It's a really a pleasure. I think it would have been a greater pleasure to be actually in Italy, but uh, we do what we have to do uh, at this point. That's, that's number... COVID life. COVID life. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but uh, then again, it allows us to do uh, many things at the same time and in different places. So. It's, uh, it has its uh, ups as well. It's quite an impressive number. Thank you all for uh, joining us. Um, I hear a lot of good mornings in my, in my, where I am, it's a good afternoon. Uh, but I uh, hope that we'll be able to have a good uh, presentation and a good discussion with you uh, afterwards. Uh, I will try to be um, brief to have a presentation of about 40 minutes, although if there are any pressing questions, please do raise your hand. I will keep an eye on the chat and I assume also um, Giovanni and uh, his colleagues uh, will. Uh, I think that Giovanni introduced me um, uh, and uh, I have a quite diverse uh, background, although uh, when he said that we need to avoid Eurocentricism, I think that I, I am not sure that I'm the good uh, start of this because I've always accused myself of being very Eurocentric, but I will try to keep that uh, in mind for the rest of the uh, presentation because I do uh, come from a um, from outside of Europe, at least uh, theoretically, uh, from outside of the European Union. Let's see, just to confirm, you can all see my screen now. Yes, wonderful. Yeah, good. Okay, so the um, we had a discussion with Giovanni how to actually, what title to give to the lecture. So um, as he mentioned, uh, 2020, besides being a pandemic year, it's expected to be a, a sort of a, a breakthrough year for uh, what is now North Macedonia in terms of its uh, European integration and we'll see in my presentation, why is that the case? I will send to uh, Giovanni later the presentation so that you all uh, have it. It has links inside as well. And you also have my contacts and the Twitter handle of my organization and my own uh, Twitter handle and my email is at the end in case anyone is really interested in uh, the Western, uh, in, in the Balkans and uh, European uh, enlargement uh, in general. Uh, let me just see, whoop, here we go, good. Uh, so uh, what we'll be discussing today is basically, this is the outline of the uh, presentation or the lecture, or whichever uh, term you want to use. So I'll give an overview of uh, the country and the basic cleavages uh, because we're trying to see how the European Union is viewed from the outside. I'll give a short overview of EU enlargement because I'm not sure how much you've covered, but we specifically on the case of uh, the Balkans. I'll reflect on uh, how has Macedonia's um, EU accession uh, story unfolded. And uh, last, um, try, I will try to give a bit of information uh, as to how is the European Union and its member states uh, how are they viewed from uh, North Macedonia, also using some of the latest data that is also uh, available from uh, relevant polls. 
Last, I will end with key dilemmas, as we all have uh, a lot of them, as to what lies ahead. They were existent before the pandemic, but they're even more pressing uh, now. Uh, well, here we go. Uh, just to be uh, on um, on uh, the as a dis disclosure note, uh, I will be using a lot the term Western Balkans. And I'm not sure that uh, a lot of you are uh, uh, familiar with that, but it's a political term because the Balkans is not that big in the end of the day to have a Western Balkans and an Eastern Balkans. But it's uh, the Western Balkans is a term, a political term that is used by the European Union also, viewing us from the outside, uh, that usually denotes the countries that are outside of the European Union. On this map that I'm showing here, uh, you have Croatia as well, although Croatia is a, uh, is a European Union member, but basically the Western Balkans, or you will find also the term Western Balkans 6 denotes uh, the countries that are uh, below Croatia. So that would be Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Montenegro, Kosovo, Albania, and uh, North Macedonia. So this is when I say the Western Balkans, these are the countries that are basically in the line that have the perspective uh, of uh, European uh, integration. Now, um, North Macedonia, uh, we saw it uh, on the map. Uh, it's a small country. Uh, uh, I put here the territory, which is 25,000 uh, square kilometers. It's basically comparable to Slovenia, if any of you would need a, a comparison. That's the closest comparison, although uh, Slovenia is uh, way economically more developed. Um, the population is roughly 2 million people. Um, the entire Western Balkans, actually all of the six countries, have about 18 million people. So it's tiny in, uh, um, when uh, it's tiny in comparison to what we have in Europe, it's basically about 5% of the entire population of the European uh, Union. I have uh, put here the, da the date uh, of the last census, which is 2002. That was a long time ago. We will discuss uh, later as to why is this the case. Currently in uh, the world, this is one, the one country that has not held the census for this long. Even Somalia did it last year. Um, as the country is ethnically diverse um, and we have a power sharing system, I will talk about it later. Uh, numbers matter a lot, especially numbers of uh, minorities or as we use the term non-majority communities. Um, the country consists of uh, uh, the main ethnicities are Macedonians, Albanians, Turkish, Serbs, Roma, and um, etc. For those of you that uh, like that are more on the economic side, it's still um, classified as a transitional uh, economy. Um, and uh, Freedom House would call would uh, name it a transitional hybrid regime uh with um, a gdp per capita of about 37 percent of the eu average at the time it was eu 20 uh 28. uh so um if we uh one of the most relevant indexes that we would like to have i would like you to, to have in mind when we talk about it because we need to see from where we're uh from where do we view the european union from um, the uh, usual classification would either be a hybrid regime or a so-called defective democracy, although the, eco the economic transformation is more, uh, more uh, advanced. These are numbers from a respective uh, Bertelsmann uh, transformation index in, the, uh, in Germany, and it uh, that usually classifies countries uh, every year, uh, and it has a relatively good uh, governance index. And just as a, in a comparison, here is a map of um, East uh, Central Europe. Uh, and you will see that basically Macedonia is a, a general average of a defective uh, democracy. You have democ a bit better ranked than her, than uh, the country are the Baltic countries, which are at the top. You can see them at uh, the map, the dark blue. The member states of the EU, which would be Slovakia and uh, the Czech Republic, and then Croatia as well and Slovenia. Basically, these uh, the comparison of a defective democracy is also would also be used in by Britelsman also for some EU member states such as Hungary, but also uh, Romania and Bulgaria are also on the right on the map. So you will see that in terms of its political classification. It's um, it, it, there's no clear line between the countries that are members of the European Union and the candidates because they're all basically here. 
uh, that are that have such a, a big uh, such a big disparity. The uh, turquoise uh, color, which is the only one, a highly defective democracy here, would be basically Bosnia and Herzegovina, which would be the only exception that you see uh, on the map. If anyone is more interested, this is a very good source that has the latest um, assessments in terms of also political developments of uh, European countries, but also economic uh, assessments uh, uh, as well. Okay, so uh, now that we've set ground in that this is a relatively functioning uh, defective democracy or a hybrid regime uh, with uh, relatively standing about 37 or 40 percent of the EU average, this is the the image that we get of from where do we see uh, from where do we stand. Um, I'm currently based in uh, as I, uh, in Skopje, and um, the defining uh, cleavages, let's say, what are the most important uh, aspects that I would like to share with you is that, the, as I said, the country is um, uh, ethnically divided. Uh, around 65% of the population is Macedonian, about 25% is Albanian, and then we have 10 that we call, that we use the term very, uh, Unfortunate term, the rest. Uh, uh, the country is based on a power sharing agreement that was introduced after a short conflict in 2001. Um, when you have such a diverse uh, ethnicity, uh, such a, when you have such a division between uh, ethnicities uh, and you have ethnically defined parties, uh, this means basically that you have also two uh, voting camps, you have two separate uh, political uh, entities. Uh, which leads to rather neglect of uh, smaller communities. So ethnic issues dominate the politics in uh, in the country. Every government basically consists of a Macedonian and Albanian uh, party. And there's a lot. Uh, yes, I can repeat. Yes, thank you. I, so it's 65% Macedonian, 25% uh, Albanian. These are the two dominant ones. And then we have 10%, which are the rest, which would be the Roma, um, Serbs, Vlachs, Bosnians, and so on. But the two, I'm mentioning the two because the, the politics in the country and also it's in some ways it's European integration has been dominated by the political struggle between the uh, political struggle, but also cooperation between uh, the major uh, ethnicities and their representative political uh, parties. Uh, I mentioned the power sharing, uh, the power sharing agreements, which basically leads to the main political battles in the country are also in terms of representation in the administration, which means public employment. It does not mean only representation, but it means spending of public money uh, and also use of languages. I am mentioning the languages because I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with linguistics, but Macedonian and Albanian are very different languages which means that there is a question of bilingualism. There's a question of how far do we introduce bilingualism because we can't, um, that because there's no easy way to communicate between each other. So these are the defining cleavages internally, which I would uh, share with you from uh, the start. And um, externally, um, the key uh, political uh, development that has, uh, plagued or that has dominated the Macedonia's also European integration, foreign policy dimensions and so on, has been a dispute with its neighboring uh, Greece uh, over the name of uh, the country. Greece disputed the use of the term of the name Republic of Macedonia. We're going to talk about that later. And hence, we are now talking about um, North Macedonia uh, as a result of a name change that happened uh, last year. Um, having in mind those two cleavages that I mentioned uh, before, I will now go through uh, two slides of key milestones, because when we talk about, um, because we can't talk about how we see Europe at this point or how we see each other unless we know what we went through, uh, at least in the near, uh, in the near past. Um, the key milestones that I would like you to uh, keep in your mind when we talk about North Macedonia is that this is a country that um, had a peaceful independence from former from, from the former Yugoslav Federation in 1991. So we were part of the former Yugoslavia. Basically, if you remember the map of the Western Balkans, all of the countries that I showed, so five of them uh, were part of former Yugoslavia, only Albania wasn't. 
Um, it's a member from the from the early 1990s of the Council of Europe. It's a member of the OSCE from the back then because that was mentioned before. So it's, the country has engaged with international organizations fairly early on. This is also one of the advantages that the country did not have a war. Most of its other most of the other countries that uh, came out of former Yugoslavia, such as Serbia, Bosnia, Croatia, they were engaged in full-on conflict, so which we were not in. So we did have a fair start in terms of engaging also with the European uh, Union and other international organizations. In uh, 2001, there was a short-lived ethnic conflict uh, between uh, the Albanians uh, and Macedonians, which was followed by constitutional changes, introducing more power-sharing elements in uh, society. Uh, and um, internally, uh, uh, last year, as I said, we changed the name to North Macedonia due to a dispute with neighboring uh, Greece in view of uh, EU and NATO accession. Um, earlier this year, the country became a member of NATO. So this is a country that slowly, very slowly, due to the dispute with uh, Greece, is socialized, is getting its place in international, um, in international uh, organizations. Uh, the, uh, we became a member of NATO that put the two years here, one after the other, in effect after the name change, because uh, the neighboring Greece vetoed the uh, accession of uh, Macedonia to, to NATO since uh, 2008. We were due to join uh, NATO with, uh, together with Albania and Croatia in 2008, but uh, until the name change happened and materialized, uh, which was uh, a discussion of last year, uh, the country was uh, kept outside of uh, the uh, venue of this international organization. Now, since we um, like, to, since the main objective that we are uh, trying to uh, achieve here is also to see how was how is the EU viewed from the outside. Uh, on this slide, we have a timeline of uh, EU and North Macedonia uh, relations. It's 2020 now, even though it seems like a very strange year. Uh, but uh, our uh, story of engaging with the EU started uh, very early on, already in 2001. Uh, if you remember, I mentioned, yes, uh, yes, Greece vetoed, uh, sorry, I'll go back to the question. Uh, yes, Greece, we, uh, we were... Let's, I will tell you a story. In Bucharest in 2008, George Bush came out, uh, George Bush Jr. came out and basically said, tomorrow, this is a NATO summit, we will have three countries joining uh, NATO. And needless to say, on the following day, uh, two countries joined NATO, uh, Croatia and Albania. And uh, on, on the meeting, it was decided that Macedonia would not join because uh, of uh, the name that it was using which lasted until last year when we changed the name. Together with Greece, we signed an agreement renaming the country to North Macedonia, and hence we joined NATO this uh, this year. Thanks for the question. We'll go. I have a couple of very interesting slides on the name change, Laura, so it's not a problem. Um, if we go back to our uh, timeline, so um, I'm using, whenever uh, I'm using some terminology that uh, you, you're not comfortable with or I'm using a uh, an abbreviation that you're not comfortable with, please uh, do drop me a question. As you can see, I'm reading them. Um, I'm uh, the Stabilization Association Agreement. This is a fancy name, but this uh, basically uh, was, was a process where agreements that were offered to the Western Balkan countries uh, in view of the enlargement process, uh, of view of uh, building linkages with the European Union that were ultimately to lead to uh, accession or to uh, becoming, to these countries becoming a member state. Um, to, we were, Macedonia was the first one to sign the, such an agreement in uh, 2001, together with Croatia. Uh, the other countries, I have a slide later, started signing such agreements from the region much, much later on. So that's why the Macedonia had a very peculiar, very, very idiosyncratic path towards its European integration because it started very early on. And now it's, and because of the, the, the dispute with Greece and other internal developments, basically uh, it, uh, it, it became, it, it came at the end of the line from being the first one uh, in uh, in the queue. Uh, 
Uh, the, the candidate status for EU membership was obtained already in 2005, um, together with uh, Croatia. Uh, yes, the agreement. Uh, the stabilization and association agreement is basically an agreement which offers a bet improved trade relations with the European uh, Union and offers easier access of goods if the country works on its democratic development in view of becoming a member state in the future. So similar agreements were offered to the um, countries of Eastern Europe, which are which we call generally the new member states, but they're not new anymore of the last enlargement. The three Baltic states, Lithuania, Estonia, uh, Latvia, then uh, the chunk of Czechoslovakia, at the time Czechoslovakia, so uh, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, and so on. These countries, before they became members of the EU, we, they were offered so-called Europe agreements. And uh, on the basis of these Europe agreements, basically the European Union saw that this worked. If you offer countries a perspective of membership, then they transform, they engage with the they uh, also work towards their political and democratic transformation. So it's a sort of a carrot. The same type of carrot was actually then transposed to the Western Balkans. Uh, and these are the so-called stabilization and association agreements. They're called stabilization because they came after conflicts. In this region, as I mentioned, half of the region in the early 1990s was engulfed in wars. You had Bosnia that had a war, Croatia had a war, Serbia had its uh, very, uh, the, Serbia was engaged in a conflict. We had the 2001 conflict, so that's why the term stabilization. The EU was also offering assistance to these countries to stabilize politically, internally, in terms of reform of their security forces, but also to assist them in uh, linkages with the European markets because in assisting their in assisting their economies. So for a lot of us, this was the sign for this region. This was the sign that the EU is likely to consider us as potential candidates, which we are, because at, at the moment, at this point in time, the only region that has still a perspective of European Union membership, in addition to what is now the European Union, is the Western uh, Balkans. And Macedonia was the first one to engage in such uh, an exercise. Uh, the uh, candidate status, as I said, was granted by the European uh, Commission in 2005. And then uh, by 2009, the country was deemed uh, as um, ready to start the accession uh, negotiations with the European Union in view of membership to become a uh, member, which is roughly the time when Croatia was negotiating, which is now a member for, for already seven, uh, seven years. Uh, the, however, because of the name dispute already in 2009, uh, the Council of the European Union could not adopt the decision that the negotiations would start because Greece was vetoing based on its own, own assessment of, uh, of the name uh, dispute. Um, and uh, practically folded up until last year uh, when uh, Let's go to that slide of the, the name, the changing the name, because I think that's a good one to do. Last year, a, um, here we go. Okay. Uh, last year, an agreement was signed with Greece. Uh, uh, that was called the PRESPA agreement. Uh, PRESPA is this lake that's in the background of these photos that's on the border between North Macedonia and Greece. Uh, and uh, the agreement, uh, basically, uh, the essence of the agreement was that the country would, would rename uh, itself to North Macedonia, adding a geographical uh, qualifier. Uh, and uh, that was followed by a name on, uh, that was followed by a, a referendum that, held, uh, that was held in, in the end of 2018. Um, I've put here the question for the referendum on the slide because it will tell you a lot as to how significant EU and NATO membership would be for the population and how it's all ingrained in the uh, development of the country. Because the, the question that we were all asked on the referendum to answer was basically, are you in favor of the EU and NATO membership by supporting the PRESPA agreement, as I mentioned, that's the agreement between Macedonia and Greece. 
So uh, what happened in this last decade, uh, the, the veto basically ended up with a um, uh, question to the all to to the population of the country uh, on uh, to being asked to respond to this question. Uh, any of you, if any of you are familiar with referenda, you know how tricky they can be. Um, you can see below the outcome of the referendum uh, in uh, North Macedonia. This was a consultative referendum. To be binding, we needed a 50% turnout, uh, which we did not reach. So it was 37% turnout. But more than 90% of those people that um, came vote uh, said yes, because they felt that this obstacle, the obstacle with Greece needed to be moved off, uh, off the table. And uh, the government went forward with renaming, uh, renaming the country to uh, North Macedonia, which uh, brings us back to 2020 uh, with uh, the, uh, the last point, which is the decision to start the accession negotiations, which Giovanni mentioned at the beginning, uh, which uh, is and to start the accession negotiations, uh, the, which means that we are waiting now for the first meeting to officially uh, commence the uh, accession uh, negotiations with the EU. This has not yet uh, materialized. Uh, I don't want to bother you with many more details on this, but uh, we are now at a phase with, in which our other neighbor, uh, Bulgaria, which is to the east, has objections also on some historical issues, but let's hope that uh, if uh, I'm invited next year, we will talk about a country that is negotiating the uh, accession process because we're still not um, we're still not clear that uh, the end of uh, this journey will be uh, will be actual start of the accession uh, negotiations. So just to be um, uh, just uh, as a comparison to the Eastern enlargement, because we talked a lot about timelines, uh, the countries of Eastern Europe that I mentioned before, uh, so the Baltic states, uh, Hungary, Poland, uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, basically uh, started their accession negotiations roughly from 97 to 99. Their accession negotiations lasted until 2002, so on average about five years. Whereas um, in this enlargement round to the Western Balkans, which is much more difficult and so on, um, we have been waiting for over almost 20 years since the first stabilization association agreement to start the uh, accession negotiations, which are likely to take uh, a, another, another decade down the road. Um, I will uh, now go uh, to uh, more. Why is this the case? Why have been we waiting uh, so long? Because I went some of the some through some of those uh, slides to the questions. Why have we been waiting so long? Uh, because after the Eastern enlargement came the economic crisis. Uh, uh, I'll go back to that question of what more Macedonia does. Need, what more does the country need to do? Uh, I, I, I put it down. Um, why are we waiting so long? Because after the Eastern enlargement came the economic crisis, came the refugee crisis. Um, the European Union expanded as exponentially uh, to uh, 27 and then 28 member states with Croatia, now back to 27. Uh, there's been talk of, of a lot of talk of uh, low absorption capacity. How has the increasing number of countries affected the decision making in the union? Um, there has been talks of uh, enlargement fatigue. Uh, the countries in the Western Balkans themselves have been um, assessed as kept states that are captured, states that are captured dominantly by political parties that don't have good checks and balances that would not make good EU future uh, member states. Um, Examples of current uh, member states from the Eastern enlargements have been used that showing that the uh, enlargement does not uh, work. Uh, the uh, two uh, sketches that I've shown uh, for you uh, here are sketches that usually the economist uses for describing the Western Balkans as, as either very fragile 
or waiting from one waiting chamber to another waiting chamber uh, and um, and so on. Yes, 2015, I'll go back to that, to the suspension of the accession negotiations. Um, the uh, These have been the buzzwords that have been related to the Western Balkans enlargement. We have situations in which uh, it's just been, uh, it's been uh, going very, very low. And as this can be seen, uh, at the next uh, at the next slide, uh, which at which you have basically all of the are currently candidate states. Um, these are the six Western Balkans that are in the line for accession. They're not candidate states, all of them, because you will see the status. Uh, which uh, you have Iceland here in Turkey. I don't know. Some of you sometimes forget that maybe you forget that Iceland has actually suspended its negotiations up with by cho by the choosing to do uh, so. And uh, there is Turkey at the bottom because Turkey is also formally still in the EU accession process. But if we take a look at um, the country's uh, progress in the uh, accession, which uh, is now linked to different phases in the third column, uh, in, you have the association agreement that I mentioned before. Then that is followed by an actual membership application, uh, a, uh, that to be followed by a candidate status and start of the accession uh, negotiations. Needless to say, it takes uh, it took very long for all of them. Macedonia is, as I said, um, the strange case because it has been waiting for a uh, very long time. Here we kept 2004 because this is when the Stabilization Association Agreement was entered into force, just so that we know. It was signed in 2001, uh, uh, like uh, I mentioned uh, before. Um, let's see. Okay, I'll go back to the to the question now. Just a second, sorry. Let's go back. Where were we? We are here. The question was 2015 to have a um, uh, to have a nego the to have the uh, uh, for accession negotiations uh, uh, for the accession negotiations. Uh, between 2009 uh, and uh, 2000, uh, you have a very. We had a very strange after 2009. We had a very strange situation because uh, by then the country was actually the best performer in uh, in the region on European integration. On some matters, it still is because it started engaging with the European institutions uh, very early on. Um, now, in 2009, I'm not sure how many of you, many of you uh, would remember, was a very significant year in terms of the Western Balkans because visa-free travel to the European uh, Union and to Schengen was, uh, re, uh, was uh, reintroduced. Um, this was a very big milestone, um, even though these countries, for most of them, with the exception of Albania, could travel by the 1990s easily uh, in, in the entire world as part of former Yugoslavia. Then since the 1990s and the war, they were put on the black Schengen list as we call it. And uh, in 2009, the big uh, we were allowed basically to travel visa-free for tourism uh, purposes. I am mentioning this because this is also a time when we had commissioners, Italian commissioners, such as Franco Frattini uh, in the European Commission, who was very enthusiastic about the Western Balkans. This is also a time when the economic crisis has still not hit very hard, and it's still a, a euro enthusiastic period for enlargement. In 2009, the European, uh, uh, the uh, European uh, Union uh, basically disengaged on on uh, on enlargement. And uh, also politically in North Macedonia, the government saw that um, there was no point in working towards European integration. So there was a lot of uh, democratic uh, backsliding. I was thinking of showing that slide, but I can add it once I send it to you. And you can see basically from 2009 when the European Union disengaged in a lot of these countries, um, it's clear that the democracy scores started dropping because the political elites basically did not see a lot of benefit in engaging with the European Union on democratic transformation. So there was a lot of internal, uh, let's say, the, the, the political elites in, turned inwards 
And uh, in uh, 2015, uh, a lot of civil, civil society, such as myself as well, we were very strongly against this disengagement from the European Union because it also acts as a stabilizing actor as a as uh, an anchor for democratization. And uh, long story short, in 2015, there was a huge wiretapping crisis in the country. Um, the scale of this wiretapping crisis was uh, was probably something that's beyond our imagination because uh, in this small country of 2 million, uh, practically 20,000 people were uh, wiretapped. Uh, by the by the police, and this led to, of course, suspension of the recommendation for accession negotiations by the European Commission. Uh, this is a time when um, the European Commission was not still very. 2013-14 was very hesitant in actually naming uh, the culprits uh, and in uh, this, in um, asking for political responsibility. Uh, why? Because 2015-14 is also the period of the refugee European crisis. And if we go back to the map, uh, you will see that the main route of the refugees from Syria and from Africa was actually through the Balkans. If you, some of you might remember uh, that uh, uh, there were serious concerns as to the state of the of uh, treat of the treatment of refugees, not only in Greece but also in Macedonia, also in Serbia. But these countries, in effect, uh, both Macedonia and Serbia, are key countries on on the route to the European Union. Uh, and these, uh, their co the cooperation of the governments here has actually been a sort of an intervening factor at the time as uh, the, how does the how will the European Union and the Commission deal uh, with the democratic backsliding at the same time when you have a government that you need on board to ensure stability and cooperation during the uh, refugee crisis. Uh, these governments here, both in Serbia, but predominantly North Macedonia, because we border Greece, which is Schengen, were asked to profile people were asked uh, unlawfully because the, uh, in many cases the European Union exported the responsibility of migration management to um, to the border officers of uh, the candidates and here also including uh, North Macedonia. So this is also one element when I think that the European Union officials became aware as to how close the Balkans are and how that basically it's an enclave if you see it if we go back to the map uh, this is basically an enclave that's surrounded by the European Union. Completely all of these countries around are all uh, European member states with uh, Greece at the bottom, then going Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, and then very close by also Slovenia and, um, and Italy. Um, so the, the uh, why am I mentioning so many times the uh, role of the European Union and the European Commission? Because uh, North Macedonia has also been a country uh, of so-called firsts. And I'm asking you here to, to, do, uh, to specifically uh, look at the, 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 first, the, the third role, which is the first to have an EU mission under the Common Foreign and Security Policy in 2001. Because in actually at the 2001 conflict, the European uh, Union, uh, through its high representative for uh, foreign and security policy, acted as a guarantor, uh, basically set down between the Macedonian and Albanian uh, side, and co-signed with them an agreement, the agreement that instituted the power sharing, and promised that they will assist the country in its European uh, European integration. And this is basically, uh, if we take a look, if we take a step back, uh, the country in, in this, uh, the, the European Union and its institutions have had a very, a very um, uh, specific role in North Macedonia, as they have in many of the, of the Western Balkans countries. In North Macedonia, on the one hand, they have acted in many cases as mediators uh, in political crisis between the different ethnicities. And at the same time, Macedonia is now a candidate, so it, the European Union acts as a framework for integration. So there's a lot of roles that the European Union officials, and here I mean mostly the what was the what was the high representative 
what used to be uh, Mogherini and is now Joseph Borrell, uh, and also uh, the commissioners for enlargement. So we are kind of in a, if you take a, the EU institutional setup, we are always in between these two um, institutions. Both of them are engaged in the Western Balkans and, uh, and, uh, down, and specifically in uh, North Macedonia. So when we take a look at, uh, I would like to, if there's one thing that I would like you to keep from today's discussion in your mind that this, of the specific Macedonian accession story is that it was a country on which the EU also tested its instruments. So the first EU mission happened here under the Common Foreign Security Policy. The first police mission of the European Union was actually here. Uh, uh, was one was uh, was in the country. Then it had the first association agreement in the region. Uh, it was the first ever to have the recommendations for accession negotiations suspended as well. So it was uh, it's uh, the 2015 situation that I mentioned. And we are likely to start the accession negotiations with a so-called revised methodology uh, with that the European um, Union adopted last year. Uh, as a result of French uh, objections to the ongoing process of, of uh, the methodology. Uh, now, I think that this would sum up my main discussion on uh, North Macedonia for you. And I would go now to the second aspect of actually how do we view each other from uh, both from within the union and from uh, from the outside, but before I go back to that, I remember that I did not tackle the question. There was a question on when was the country put on the Schengen blacklist. The Schengen blacklist was conceived at the end of the 1990s, so in 2000. But then, because of the wars, uh, each of and prior to that, the, the European Union member states did not have a common policy uh, on this. Some of them decided to exclude, for example, Croatia was always excluded, even though it was engaged in a war. Croats never needed visas for Italy and for some of the bordering states for Slovenia, whereas the rest of the Balkans was, intro was, intro uh, was uh, under a visa regime with all the European Union uh, member states at the time. Remember, there were 15, then there was not 27 uh, or uh, 28. But basically, with the, after 1999, all of these countries were put, with the exception of Croatia, again, they were put on uh, on uh, the Schengen uh, blacklist, and they were removed from that list in 2009. All of them, with the exception of Kosovo, which is still which still requires visa for travel to uh, to Schengen. Basically, Kosovo is one of the countries in the world that unfortunately fares uh, together with Afghanistan in terms of how how much its citizens can move freely um, uh, without uh, a visa requirement. Uh, so I think that by now, having mentioned that uh, the country, that uh, North Macedonia has uh, remained in the EU pipeline uh, so long, from uh, uh, 2001, I think that uh, one of the questions that I always uh, keep, keep question, have in my head is how does the population feel and uh, do they feel disengaged? So on this slide, you can see the support of the public, the public support in North Macedonia uh, for European uh, integration. This basically would mean, would, uh, from two, at the bottom, you have 2000 and, uh, from 2008, April 2008, which is the, the, the date when uh, things started going downhill or the, the veto from uh, Greece uh, happened uh, in terms of our NATO accession up until February 20. This is a, a poll of the International Republican Institute that's rather reliable, that's very comparable to other polls in the region, to, to other poll, reliable polls in the country as well. You can see that in April uh, 2008, we had a horrendously high uh, support for the European, for European Union membership, which was 96%. Uh, this is even unreal. Uh, but, uh, and you can see that the low point in Macedonians, sorry, Macedonians, that's what, because we are now still in Macedonia. Let's see the poll from uh, Macedonia. How, uh, and the, the low point was uh, basically around 2014, 2016, which is around 70%. However, uh, after uh, the um, um, 
change of the name and the opening up of the European accession process once more. By now, we are now at a certain figure of about 80%, uh, percent, which is still a very high one. Uh, this is an incredibly high number of the Macedonian population supporting European uh, Union membership, even though the country, as I said, has been really has had its own uh, process and its own um, idiosyncratic uh, accession uh, and being in the waiting room for about uh, uh, a decade. What are the reasons? I've also included a slide and I've also sent you a reading as to uh, um, the reasons why people support uh, EU, EU membership. Um, the uh, improvement, the, what is expected is actually improvement of the standard of living, reduction of unemployment, uh, and uh, most improvement of, uh, of democracy are the key uh, reasons, as well as improved, as well as improved stability uh, and security uh, of the country. So there's a mental uh, understanding that European Union membership would contribute to the well-being also economically, but also on, on the uh, democratic uh, front. These figures oscillate. Yes, yes, it's a poll about Macedonians. Yes. Uh, these figures oscillate. We're still in Macedonia. Uh, so these figures oscillate, but generally the biggest expectation uh, is, uh, is that there would be uh, improved well-being of the population. There was a question of the possibly outlier of 2016. Um, 2015 and 16 were a very difficult, uh, were very difficult politically for the country because of the wiretapping crisis that I mentioned uh, before, uh, and there was a big political crisis. Um, the European Union, due to the migration, uh, due to the refugee crisis was not seen to respond uh, adequately, adequately and strongly enough. It was seen that it was, in many cases, let's say, collaborating with uh, some, of the, uh, some of the politicians that contributed to the democratic backsliding. This also is a very, if, you, if we take, I did not put those figures, for example, in 2016, there was a very low trust also in, um, in the European Union and the European Union institutions because they were not seen to be um, responding strong enough to uh, some of the uh, unfortunate events in the country. As I said, the big wiretapping crisis and so on. And you still have EU officials that would come and uh, primarily be interested on the migration or refugee crisis rather than the democratic development of the country, to put it very bluntly. So uh, the, uh, this was a reason, uh, this is at least my understanding, uh, of the um, a drop in the EU trust, but also the support, specifically uh, in uh, 2016. Uh, now, uh, let's see now, okay. I'll go back to the, to the Visegrad countries, but uh, I would like to reflect lastly on, uh, also on the positions that we saw the position on EU membership, but there are, um, different positions, let's say, towards the key member states. How do the, how does the public perceive the key the EU member states as such? Because Germany is primarily seen as the main driver and supporter of European integration for the Western Balkans. It is the biggest trade partner of the country uh, as well. Um, uh, Italy uh, in the region is mostly perceived as a strong supporter of Albania. Not uh, not that much uh, the rest of the region, and um, the one uh, missing component that we have in our enlargement process is France, uh, because uh, France has largely been seen as ambivalent. France does not engage a lot with the region; it does not have huge economic ties. Uh, and uh, uh, last year, it was also the country that in effect stop some of the key decisions on uh, accession negotiations uh, in requesting that the commission revises its methodology so that the process, so that the accession would be more uh, effective. And uh, why am I mentioning here France? Because of the, the, the big three in the European Union, the, which used to be uh, Germany, France, and the UK, let's say coupled with Spain as well, would be the most important decision makers. Now, with the UK outside of the picture, 
France has been regaining a lot of its ground, and a lot of the political uh, discussions on enlargement have uh, focused on uh, basically uh, deciphering what has been the French view of uh, enlargement, having in mind that uh, President Macron launched a lot of initiatives, including a new convention or a new conference on the future of Europe, which still does not engage uh, with with the Western Balkans. So the from uh, where the, the one of the weak points of the engagement of the region with the eu in terms of enlargement has been also the focus on uh, germany instead of the uh, other uh, key eu member states uh, as well uh, the last i want us for us to see the other coin of the the other side of the coin which is basically Evidently, the Macedonian public is very supportive of enlargement and it's working and it's trying to uh, move, uh, uh, work for that goal. But um, if we take a look at the support for further enlargement in the European Union, uh, this is a Eurobarometer from uh, last autumn. This are the opinion in the European Union, as you can see. The numbers are not uh, that positive. Basically, the, and even though this is the most positive we've had in years, the average is about 45%. Uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, you can see at the bottom, uh, you have some of the key old uh, EU member states, the new EU member states, which are sometimes less relevant at the decision table are uh, quite strong uh, supporters of enlargement but there is when we engage with our european counterparts in the think tank community or when we go to meetings it in, it is clear that there is a lot of hesitation as to the accession in general and the enlargement of uh, of the western uh, balkans as such and this is one of the key variables that one needs to uh, one needs to uh, sort out on this map, you can clearly see the way that the, the Western Balkans is actually engulfed by the EU because the white countries that are in white all around, uh, surrounded by the European Union member states are actually uh, the region we have been uh, talking about uh, today. Uh, the key, uh, I would like to end with a couple of key dilemmas and then we'll go back to uh, the question. What are the key dilemmas that we have? Um, will we actually live to see EU membership? Because uh, I can give you my own uh, story. I've been, I have started uh, working on this in um, studying European integration in 2000, and now it's 2020. We've not started the accession uh, negotiations, and um, it's really a question of how many lifetimes will it take. Uh, the other dilemma that we have is what kind of EU will we join or if we will join it uh what will the post pandemic or differentiated union uh look like um i mentioned france uh, before because from where we stand and this is i think very relevant for the discussion on eurocentrism uh where we stand we see european enlargement as a way of completing europe completing the picture uh making it more secure bringing a region that's anyway uh, in any uh, that's highly interconnected with uh, with the union, uh, whereas uh, on the other hand, um, the if we if you talk to let's say uh, a couple of very pro-European uh, French elites, they consider that they need to protect uh, the the European project. That some of these countries, most of these countries will possibly never be ready, and that the inclusion of new EU member states might lead to um, a dissolution, might lead to basically a weaker union. So there is this debate of do we need to, of, uh, uh, enlarging versus deepening, which is constantly uh, plaguing the enlargement debate, and it's still uh, uh, in our uh, in our Western Balkans enlargement. Um, the big problem is that uh, for us, and I started with this multi-ethnic dimension, is such a multi-ethnic small country sustainable down the road? And you would be you would be surprised how many times I'm being asked this by politicians in the European uh, in the European Union. Multi-ethnicity is expensive. Bilingualism is expensive. How and will we be able to uh, sustain it? Uh, 
one of the key dilemmas that uh, that's also linked to European integration is the question of emigration and depopulation, because this this whole region, the Western Balkans, um, is uh, rapidly uh, depopulating. Most of the, a lot of the young people and a lot of the immigration is directed towards Europe, Germany, Italy, and so on. A lot of the skilled people are leaving because even in this case. Uh, even in these circumstances, the request for labor that's all over the European Union is very easily filled by uh, part of the skilled labor from, from the Western Balkans, which is culturally close, which has a tradition of emigrating and also integrates uh, pretty well in most of these countries. Uh, the last question that I did want to pose uh, to you is, I'm not sure how many of you are interested, but this is, let's say, one of my primary interests is the question of uh, the rule of law in the European Union, uh, because a lot of the discussions on enlargement have actually revolved about around the weak rule of law in the Western Balkans, uh, but uh, also the question of how do we regulate rule of law issues in the European uh, uh, Union, because uh, the violations of rule of law have been key to some of the member states of the European Union saying no to, to, to future enlargement. And I think that unless that dilemma is solved in the European Union, it will be very difficult for us to uh, move forward uh, in uh, in the uh, European uh, integration um, forward in a meaningful way, uh, because the objective is not only to integrate, but the objective is to actually assist the Western Balkans in its democratic transformation through the uh, through the uh, accession process, as was the case in a lot of the Eastern uh, European countries. Now, going to the, the Eastern European countries and the US, um, new EU member states, there's a lot of discussion. I, mean, we, I come from a generation that after, let's say, in 2008, 9, was very comfortable in saying that enlargement was the biggest success of the European Union. Now, today, we, we see that truth or that statement being contested on many grounds, giving examples of countries that are violating the rules and so on. But uh, there's also countries that are very well performers. The, some of the Baltic states, Estonia, Slovenia would be very decent. It's not that all of them are performing uh, badly. So I think that these generalizations, um, we need to be very careful with them. And for us, it's very important uh, now from the Western Balkans to actually Try to work towards for the bad, for the good examples, not to for the countries that uh, are uh, the current violators in, uh, that we are being given as examples. And at the end of the day, from where we stand, we don't see that the decision making in the union has been uh, that much blocked. The, these countries have not acted in many cases as um, veto points. So it's not. Uh, we hope that we can engage with the public in the European Union. That's actually. Uh, supportive and can, that can see the positive uh, of the enlargement uh, process. I will stop there now and I'll go to your questions because uh, there were a couple of them that I think that we uh, uh, that I missed. Um, yes, the Visegrad, uh, uh, the Visegrad group. Uh, and you can write them down, or I'll check the raised hand if I'm missing uh, anyone uh, later. Uh, do, 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 there was the Visegrad group, yes. Uh, it's a strong bond economically and politically. Uh, when we talk about Macedonia, generally it's also the, the region. There's not so much strong links as one can expect uh, with the Visegrad groups. The Visegrad um, Politically, uh, they're used, they're, the previous government of uh, Macedonia was very linked with uh, Orban, uh, and uh, there is a very strange link of the Serbian government at this point with, uh, with the Hungarian government uh, as well. This also goes back to the refugee crisis that I mentioned uh, before, because if you remember in 2015, there were a couple of plans in the European Union as to how to deal with the refugee crisis most notably Hungary uh, opposing Germany, but we were in that in that specific period, we were mostly on, on the with the Hungarians. Um, but uh, in terms of the Visegrad group, there's some something that I would like to mention that there have been discussions and recommendations to the region, uh, to the Western Balkans, to actually look at the Visegrad group to 
be more innovative as to how the Western Balkans positioning in the EU will look, because there's a lot of conflict between the countries in the Western Balkans. I mean, as I heard in hours with Greece and Bulgaria might be the easier ones. You have Kosovo and Serbia and so on. So one of the dimensions that we are working on is actually to build a regional uh, a regional economic political entity similar to the Visegrad group that might be able to assist down the road in the in European uh, uh, process. Uh, Italy, yes. Uh, the uh, in uh, North Macedonia, Italy is close to the region, so it's not. I mean, we have a lot of uh, from, we have a lot of immigration recently and so on. But politically, it is seen as the country that largely supports uh, primarily Albania as uh, as its neighbor. Um, and um, in recent, in the last couple of years, there have been concerns about Macedonia being more advanced in the European integration process, just for being there for a longer time, in comparison to Albania. Whereas the European Commission put the, the movement of the two countries on a parallel track, they were given, they were uh, for the last two years on the summits of the European Union, the decisions have been made for both countries on the start of the accession negotiations. Uh, Netherlands has been very hesitant about Albania uh, and has been opposing the start of the accession negotiations with Albania. And at some points, Italy has been seen as the country that has been pushing uh, let's say for Albania forward, resulting sometimes in uh, a backlog on both Macedonia and Albania, but generally it is seen as the Albanian uh, supporter. Spain. Um, Spain is, a, why is it so positive about enlargement? Spain is a big country that also largely uh, considers that it has benefited from European uh, integration. So it's one of the countries from the big ones that is generally positive about enlargement, but when you ask them about the specific of the Western Balkans, then the then the population becomes less uh, less positive, in comparison to the eastern uh, to the new EU member states, which are very positive about enlargement. But then, when they um, think down the road that they might need to uh, disburse some of the money from uh, the structural and cohesion funds from the European Union for underdeveloped region regions with these countries from the Western Balkans, they might become uh, less so, but they're still uh, more uh, more supportive. I'll go back to the rule of law. Uh, is the Albanian minority pushing for secession and uh, unification with uh, Albania? Uh, no, uh, the uh, Macedonian, the Albanian uh, minority has um, has a very um, has a constitutive status in uh, in the country. Uh, the main uh, cross border links uh, of of the Albanian um, community are actually with uh, Kosovo, uh, not that much with Albania uh, uh, itself. And uh, because of the strong role of the Albanian parties in the in the government, but also. System that the country has, we have been very supportive of Kosovo. We were one of the first countries to actually recognize it, uh, and uh, as a result of this, uh, Serbia has, in many at many points, been angry with us. Let's put it that way, because uh, Serbia has we have rather enraged Serbia on some of the because of the rec of the early recognition and the rather decent political ties. Uh, with uh, with Kosovo and Macedonia, uh, Germany. Um, I would say uh, it was said Germany is, the, as I said, the supporter of enlargement overall to the Western Balkans. Uh, the German per percentage is uh, is low, but the political elites, specifically uh, Chancellor Merkel, uh, and also the Social Democrats in Germany, have been are rather aware of uh, the of the extensive ties of the European Union, uh, of the European Union, and specifically Germany with the region. So, population might 
uh, the gender exchange uh, with the region is uh, extremely significant also uh, uh, for Germany and that the European Union can't just turn a blind eye to develop to the developments in the region also uh, specifically uh, after the migration crisis they are aware that they need to engage to stabilize the region to keep it to assist its transformation because keeping it in a, such a status quo in uh, which it is outside of the or outside of the union does not really benefit uh, anyone uh, could you repeat the emigration that population problem yes i can uh, the um Countries of the Western Balkans, I can send you some links if anyone is uh, uh, interested in this. There were a lot of good, uh, there's a lot of good research being done uh, recently. But uh, let's say um, to give you a illustrative figure, uh, we officially Macedonia has about 2 million people. The World Bank uh, assessments will tell you that in the last 12, 13 years, about 600,000 people, which means one third of the country has left. And this is a striking figure. This is a huge figure that's not unknown to the region, that it's worse in Bosnia. These are population, these are population movements that have happened in some of the new EU member states as well, such as Bulgaria has lost a lot of its population, Lithuania, Romania has lost a lot of its population. But the concern that we have is actually when you lose the population at this very early stage of the European integration, then it might be even uh, it might be even worse. And most of the a lot of the skilled people, skilled people uh, um, a lot of the skilled people are leaving because there's a lot of demand, primarily in Germany, uh, but other uh, other European Union member states are uh, as well uh, the, the, the recipient uh, countries for the region. Uh, Uh, yes, the if people agree to enlarge the EU, yes, you're right that uh, most people after Brexit have, a, as I said, these are the most positive figures that uh, that uh, we have seen. Uh, they think about Turkey, but the, Turkey is off off limits for most of them. But then the other countries of the Western Balkans also don't fare uh, very well. You would not find a specific country that would have more than. 10, 15 uh, percent approval uh, in terms of support of European public for uh, for uh, enlargement. Serbia in some countries fares better. It also depends on the the public opinion in some of the EU member states. Depends also on how do people view the specific diaspora from that uh, uh, from that country. But none of us really, uh, really fare well. It's also very difficult to disentangle what do people think of one country and another because people also think of the Balkans as a chunk. They see it as one uh, big region. Sometimes in some countries such as the Netherlands, there is, and sometimes Albania might fare worse. But generally, there's no, not such a clear uh, distinction as to the uh, specificities uh, of uh, all of them. Uh, what has influenced such a low turnout in the referendum? Yes, the referendum. Uh, the, uh, the referendum was a surprise to a lot of us because uh, the issue, the, the Greece uh, um, dispute was was very emotional. I mean, I still have a very difficult time uh to say north macedonia to keep reminding myself that it's north macedonia i don't think that i've told i've i'm not i'm not sure that i've told my six-year-old daughter that it's north macedonia uh but um the uh if we take a look at polls i'm not very much a fan of polls but i think that they show us sometimes numbers uh is uh, uh they show us some data that can be good for uh discussion um, if we took a look at polls before 2019, it was very difficult to forecast what would happen in the referendum. Uh, most polls in 2016-15 would basically uh, illustrate the situation in which about 10% of the population would be ready to change the name for European integration. 
Most of them, most of the public in responses was very hardline. We will not change the name for European integration, especially not for um, internal use. So we would not change the constitution. Most of the discussion was, can we change it for international use um, rather than uh, rather than internally? But then the, this uh, agreement was uh, signed. Uh, then uh, the agreement was signed and uh, the, um, it was agreed that we would change the name internally uh, as well. Uh, but uh, the agreement was also seen as a sort of a restart of the European integration of the country, of uh, a, a possibility to talk about European Union membership again, because by then, by then it was really even though with those numbers, it was clear that because of the name uh, that this would not uh, this would not happen. So um, the agreement was also very much praised by European officials. We actually had most of the uh, engagement with the European Union member states at the time uh, was around the name change. We had Chancellor Merkel coming personally to Skopje before the referendum to convince the population to vote for uh, for the name change, which might be a good uh, image to show uh, at some other lecture. And um, basically, uh, so the public was largely swerving, let's say, was opening up to the possibility that this might mean good for the future. Uh, but uh, the Population that was against the referendum, that was against the name change, uh, at the referendum opted for a boycott rather than actually coming out to uh, to vote. Which means that uh, as a result, you only had the people supporting the change coming out to vote. That's why, as I said, you had 90% of everyone or 93, 5, something like that, of everyone who came out to vote, voted yes. The people that were against held a campaign to boycott the referendum because in that case the decision would not be binding so if if we have if we had met the 50 percent target it was rather expected that the referendum would pass but if you uh don't meet the 50 percent target then there are a lot of there is a possibility of contestation as to how valid was that referendum even though it was consultative how how do we now deal with the situation in which you don't have the 50 percent because it was uh, by national rules it was a failed referendum let's put it that way so the the people that were against were actually boycotting they did not come out to uh vote i hope that answers uh the questions a lot uh yes uh the could you tell me what you think about the mini schengen idea in the balkans and how do you think this affects the integration uh of uh in the european union uh for those of you that don't know so uh the mini schengen was an idea promoted by serbian and albanian uh prime ministers uh the presidents uh, rama and uh, uh vucic uh, of uh, building a region in the Balkans, so-called mini Schengen, which would replicate the four freedoms that are existing in the in the European uh, Union. I think that on paper it sounds like uh, a great idea, uh, and uh, the countries of the region need to be pushed towards opening uh, up their borders and synchronizing their uh, markets, their recognition of qualifications, because this is what the food safety standards, because this is what the creation of such, a, such an area uh, entails. Um, the risk that uh, we see from where we are in North Macedonia is that um, given that we have started aligning with European legislation very early on, we, have pre we, have, we might have higher standards in some areas such as, for example, food safety. That's why I mentioned it. So uh, the question is, at which, where do we put the bar for the European, for the integration? Because you would not like to lower your bar for food safety standards for the sake of opening up a market and being basically less safe. So there's a lot of, uh, I think that it can only work if it leads to, um, as a stepping stone towards European integration, because it would be very difficult to sell to the any of the publics in the region 
a form of integration that would only mean uh, mean the Balkans, uh, because I think that from where we stand, we are very Eurocentric, and most of the also the expectations of the public and uh, the political goals are to move forward with uh, with the European uh, integration. And I think that the the main uh, uh, people that have concerns have these concerns of where do we set uh, where do we set the bar? I mean. There was a lot of there's politically you will hear a lot of discussions. Will Serbia dominate because it's the biggest? Uh, will Serbia and Albania dominate and so on? But I think that in my view the question is how do, where do we set uh, where do we set the bar? Uh, uh, Alexandra, can you just explain? Or just turn on of why you didn't get that why changing the name was relevant for which situation. Or you can just write us just so that I know. I'll go to Lorenzo's question. Uh, the migrant acceptance incidents. Macedonia and Western Balkans countries are the least accepting countries in the world. Moreover, in NGO reports, uh, violence, uh, NGOs report violence pushbacks and migrant rights violations. How do you think that the situation will change going in the EU? Is there a risk to have another Visegrad-like group opposing a fair management of migration in Europe? Uh, the, uh, yes, the Western Balkans countries are some of the least accepting countries in, uh, in uh, the world in terms of uh, migration, in terms of uh, the attitudes of the population. The, uh, however, we cannot, at least in my view, we cannot disentangle the policy of pushbacks of, uh, unfortunately, of the local uh, border guards from the broader European Union uh, policy. Because uh, the, if you talk and if you uh, talk to most of the Europe, to the border guards at, uh, the crossing points uh, in uh, North Macedonia and also in Serbia, they don't operate uh, by themselves. In most of them, they operate together with Frontex or with European Union uh, border guards officials. So uh, basically our borders uh, are co-managed with the European Union and the pushbacks were a response to to the largely to the demand of the European uh, Union uh, officials. I mean, this is not a good response. This is not that I'm justifying the response, but you cannot see the responses on, on this side uh, solely as a uh, sovereign decision, because in a, if we take a look at back at the unraveling of uh, the situation between Macedonia, between the European Union and Serbia and Macedonia, these were unfortunately rather coordinated uh, activities, mostly, as I said, with Hungary. The risk is definitely to see uh, a Visegrad group uh, opposing a uh, fair management of migration. But at the same time, I think that these countries will also be faced, as they are facing now, uh, a need of uh, labor. So. Uh, the, but, but at the same time, we cannot expect that they will develop their own progressive migration policy without seeing that happening in the European Union. Because bo both of them are linked. In many cases, the refugee wave that we see through this region is not to stay here, because no one, basically no one stayed here. And uh, we, if we are down the road to make these countries uh, attractive, then this will have to be a joint. Uh, uh, this will have to be a joint uh, policy. Uh, okay, how was its name a problem? Okay, sorry. Let's go back to that now. Uh, the name change of uh, Macedonia was, if we take a look historically, one of the key decisions that any country has ever made in view of uh, uncertain European integration and uh, in view of joining uh, NATO. Its name was previously a problem because Greece objected to the use of only the term Macedonia, which the country has had for since 1945. So it was in effect 
denying, let's say, in some views, denying the right of self-identification to its neighbor, which is rather, um, which has not been a common uh, practice in uh, either international law or international uh, politics. At the same time, uh, the uh, we even Macedonia even had a dispute in front of the the International Court of Justice on this on uh, this topic because Greece was claiming that we had violated our previous agreements and basically the court said no Macedonia did not violate anything basically it was Greece that vetoed so not to make a long uh, a short a longer story uh, out of this what I was hoping to convey, and uh, in terms of both of NATO and in terms of the EU, was that the population and the, the, a huge political sacrifice, which might, uh, which will affect a specific country, was made in view of uh, achieving the goal of uh, European integration. There's a lot of people in the country that are still unhappy with the decision to change the name because it's seen as that we have impeded on our identity. Uh, a lot of people feel that we have uh, sold out in uh, brackets for uh, an uncertain future of European integration, going back to what was the question uh, in the referendum. And it's likely to leave a lot of, to create a cleavage within the country that if I was giving this lecture, let's say in 10 or 20 years, on the first slide on the cleavages, it would not only be the ethnicity, and uh, but it would also be the position, the national, the personal position, or the political positioning towards the name change of the country for the sake of international uh, organizations' membership. And here I mean the EU and the and uh, NATO. Uh, and I did not cover the rule of law one, and I think we are towards the end, so there are more. Uh, no worries, Alexandra. Thank you for the question. Uh, the rule of law one, yes. Um, the European Union integration and the European uh, Union enlargement has before, let's say, traditionally for someone who studied it, such as myself, was seen as a tool that was supposed to assist the democratic governance of the countries to prove its rule of law standards and uh, so on. Um, in the last couple of years in the European Union, we see countries which are uh, violating principles of rule of law, and we don't see the European uh, Union being able to sanction such uh, such behavior. Uh, we we've, we've seen cases in which this was the this was the, uh, of judicial independent problems with judicial independence in Poland. We've seen a lot of developments uh, in Hungary, but not only these two. We see a lot of developments that in Bulgaria. And uh, from where I stand, when I need to go to the TV, let's say, and support like, some of the re judicial reforms in view of European accession, basically, uh, if you don't see a positive development in the EU on rule of law, if you don't see the European Union at least developing some instruments for sanctioning rule of law violations, it is very difficult to motivate here uh, the decision makers and the stakeholders to actually do something to improve rule of law in view of European integration. You always, of course, you always do the reforms for, and some of the key uh, reforms for uh, the sake of the country itself, but uh, then we question why do we need, what is the objective of the European integration? If it's not, if we cannot uh, claim soundly and uh, without a doubt that uh, the EU is a community which is bound on rule of law, then it makes it very difficult to actually support some of the necessary reforms that were asked for, uh, that were, were, that was a question posed before. Uh, for the sake of uh, European uh, integration. So I think that down the road, unless we see the European Union as a normative uh, rule of law model, then it's very difficult to sustain uh, the trust and also the support for European integration. Let's see. 
Are there any other questions that I did not answer or Giovanni, you have any comments? Yeah, yes, I have one. I have one. Yes. Thing. Yeah, that is what are, what are the, um, uh, the positions uh, um, within uh, the political spectrum in uh, Macedonia or within civil society about uh, the economic implications uh, of accession. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there are, I know, for example, that uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina there are some uh, social movements which are which which fear the, the, the economic implications of the, of this the neoliberal neoliberal implications of the of this of the of the European project the, the EU project and so on and the fight against this so uh, is there any, any anything uh, like this in uh, in Macedonia and what are the positions about this uh, the key political actors in the country would be very supportive politically of uh, European integration of uh, European accession, uh, whereas the economic dimension has been uh, rather uh, neglected. Uh, but then again, as I said, for example, uh, in the specific case of North Macedonia, um, having the biggest trade uh, with uh, yeah the European Union and primarily with Germany, it makes it uh, difficult to put forward some of these arguments. We do have a smaller party in Parliament that voices these concerns as to the um, uh, neoliberal dimension of uh, EU accession, specifically the neglect of social rights, workers' rights, and so on. But this is still a very small, uh, this is still a very small uh, party. Unfortunately, uh, we do not see a clear, these are countries which have pretty weak policy making systems and they don't forecast or evaluate properly the impact of what the European integration uh, would cost, let's say, or what would it mean for some of the, for uh, some of the industry that we have. The biggest concern that uh, a lot of us uh, have is how and if the region if we take a step back, one of the biggest concerns that I should have possibly mentioned as well is uh, how will the region fit with the European Green Deal and uh, to how will it implement European standards on environment? Because uh, for those of you that don't know, for example, we have the in the Western Balkans, there's 16 coal plants that pollute as much as the entire European Union uh, does in terms of coal. So this is, these are huge coal producers that we use extensively. And uh, the impact on some of these industries will be inevitably, uh, will be inevitably strong. Now, going back to your uh, question as to the neoliberal on whether the European Union, as I say, for some of my colleagues is a pure neoliberal project. Unfortunately, in a lot of these countries, um, the uh, policy, economic policies have been rather conservative, even from uh, after the uh, after independence. Mostly Serbia and Macedonia have been competing for foreign direct investments in factories in, which have been extensively violating social rights. But the foreign direct investments which come also from the European Union itself and the European Union uh, member states so there's a lot of concern uh down the road however at the same time there's a cost of being excluded there's the cost of um sending your skilled people exporting your skilled people above uh, to the european union there's also the cost of uh, tariffs there's also the cost of not being part of the mainstream routes of development of research and these are all uh, prices that the country is paying as long as it's staying outside of uh, the European uh, integration process. I think that by large, both economically and politically, the EU accession goal is not uh, as such contested, but practice and experience has shown that the closer you get, these issues become more real. That's why uh, we had in 2008, 96% of the population supporting this, whereas the difficult reforms were seen to be pushed down the road. We are, if we start the accession negotiations, then I think that some of these difficult reforms will have to be actually materialized and we might see some of the opponents coming up because we will have something to talk in practice.
Okay. So maybe there's one question more there or not? Let me see. Ah, the Greek socioeconomic tra tragedy and the Macedonian economy. Ah, thank you for that. I should have mentioned actually that putting the, the dispute with Greece aside on the name, uh, Greece is the biggest investor in uh, North Macedonia and has been traditionally. It's close by. Uh, we have had a lot of cross-border exchange. We uh, go to the Greek seaside regularly. It's three hours from here. So the, uh, the economic ties between the countries were never actually severed. Uh, the, um, luckily, uh, some of the biggest investments that were in, uh, that were in North uh, Macedonia uh, did not uh, go bust. Uh, but uh, so the, the immediate economic impact was, uh, was not dramatic. In any case, if we do, uh, if we forecast, and uh, there were investments which did not, uh, which uh, did not happen. Uh, but uh, then again, a lot of external uh, actors will actually also outline that uh, maybe it was a, it, it was a twist of uh, um, many uh, uh, an interplay of a lot of factors which brought to power Tsipras, who basically before he lost power, he decided to. Um, signed the agreement with North Macedonia on the name because, and we did not have a time to discuss this, but it was also not very easy in Greece to uh, to, resol to resolve the dispute with Macedonia on the on the name. Uh, in effect, uh, this was one of the issues that led to Tsipras's government falling, uh, and uh, this. But uh, still, uh, some of the his. Force of personal, but also party political affiliation, uh, were such that it created a constellation in which this was uh, possible uh, possible to be signed. Okay. Okay. So I think I think that our time is over, uh, Simonida. Yes. 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 yes because uh, because it's seven to four. Seven yeah. to four, yeah. So, uh, so thank you very much to everybody, and thank you very much for this uh, for this fantastic lecture. And uh, okay, and uh, and uh, and see you soon. Thank you for everything. Thank okay. you, thank you very much. I hope you found it uh, useful. I will send you the slides uh, and you have my contact there. Thank you, Giovanni, for the uh, invitation. It was a pleasure. Have a good day and take care, all of you. Okay, thank you very much. See you soon. See you. Simonita, can you can you see my message in chat or not? Let me see. Oh, I might. No, maybe not. No, no, I should be able to. Let me just find it where it is because I moved something. Ah, yes, here it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was oh, just no. asking if you, if you can wait for a second. No, because, yeah, yeah. because yeah, no, no, because you know, we, uh, now I'm I'm publishing, I'm editing a, a book which is a, 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 an online book published by by um, the Torino World Affairs Institute, which is uh, 
the um, the think tank the think tank which is promoting uh, co-promoting this uh, this seminar series and uh, this program um, collecting uh, the most um, interesting and the best uh, lectures of these uh, uh, series uh, of the past editions of these editions and the past ones mm -hmm. uh, so uh, just to ask you if you if you could join us, that is, if you could write a, a paper on the topic of your lecture, of course, we can we can go mm -hmm. into details, of course. And uh, and uh, the deadline would be, let's say, April, May, something like this. Oh, yes, 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 I can do that. Yeah, because there are, there are maybe, maybe you know, Maybe you know um, Jovan Teokarevic. Do, yes. uh, do, do yes. you know him? Yeah, yeah, yeah I do. Yeah. Yeah, and and uh, and Kapizic. Do you know him? Yes, Damir. Idamir Kapizic. Yeah, yes, yeah. both of, both of them are on board. So yeah, <laughs> so they are they they will contribute to, to this book because I, I invited them in in. Uh, in the, in the latest uh, editions uh, mm -hmm. and so on. So I, if you agree, I would um, I would write to you uh, with some uh, with some details, uh, and then yes, we can. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah definitely, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because we we decided for this online uh, format because uh, we would like to to, do, to to promote a wide circulation of this book. Yes, yes, for sure. Wonderful. No, no, I have to get myself uh, writing, so it's a great offer. I will. Uh, I last year has been quite hectic, but now that we will be locked down, we can write. <laughs> I, yes, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. No worries. Uh, okay, okay. Okay. Thank you very much again. Uh, we'll be in touch then about this. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. I will write you very soon. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Ciao. Ciao.